Well, one of the things I've learned after, or I've experienced after being at the university and sort of the research community for 40 years is you get picked to review lots of papers. So you get to see lots of, and get, you, know, you get to see works of lots of graduate students. So you get to see lots of badly written papers. You know. In a typical conference, only 10 to, in the computer science world, only 10 to 20 percent of the submitted papers are, uh, are accepted. And those are the good ones. So, you, uh, so most of what you read are the 80 percent that don't get accepted. So you know, you'll typically get an answer that says, the results do not confirm this theory, so we, so we have to modify our approach. I've never read a paper that says, you know, this is wrong, I'm going to abandon this topic. Uh, no one ever says that. And uh, the goals of falsifiability um, are not really well, I th that should be taught along with the scientific method. For example, uh, Freud is not considered, you know, a popular uh, psycho, uh, psychoanalytic theory uh, much anymore. Of course, his results are not falsifiable, some of his results are not falsifiable. Uh, for example, uh, a lot of his theory was a lot of your problems are due to your uh, problems with, with, with your parents, usually your mother. So if you have problems with your mother when you see a psychoanalyst, it means, aha, the theory's right. If you don't have problems with your mother, it means you're just denying it. So uh, <laughs> th there really is a problem with your mother. So there's no way to falsify that theory. Whichever way you come out, uh, uh, you know, the re his theory applies. The language of science is mathematics. This is another famous cartoon. <laughs> Uh, I think it should be ex more explicit <laughs> here in step two. So that a miracle occurs. Uh, anytime you give a talk in the software engineering world, the following quote is always expressed. I've seen it in, in, a, in, in maybe, I was going to say hundreds of talks, but certainly you know, 20 or 30 talks. Uh, um, Lord Kelvin um, made the statement, I often say that when you can measure what you are speaking about and express it in numbers, you can know something about it. But when you cannot express it in numbers, your knowledge is of a meager and unsatisfactory kind. So that basically says science means you can sort of quantify something. You, you can come up with some explicit counting process that describes some, some activity or some phenomenon. The quote that's, I think, equally important, and I've certainly seen this again in my experience in the software engineering world, is one that's, a, I don't know if this is true or not, but supposedly by British economist Josiah Stamp, said in 1929. He wasn't quite talking about research, but I think that the sentiment applies. The government is very keen on amassing statistics. They collect them, add them, raise them to the nth power, take the cube root, and prepare what wonderful diagrams. But what you must never forget is that every one of those figures comes in the first instance from the village watchman who just puts down what he damn pleases. <laughs> and there's a message there, too. You need to collect relevant numbers. Just collecting numbers and regurgitating them through computer. Excel is a wonderful tool. You can do all kinds of formulas and generate all kinds of answers and get all kinds of results that may or may not mean anything. Um, a typical, again, I mentioned I, I review lots of papers. And there's a whole series of papers that have come out, especially in the early two, 2000s, on uh, complexity measures of software. How complex is this code? You know, Java is a, is a very popular language now for writing web applications. So there are lots of applications, that, you know, lots of papers that says, I have a new m way to measure the complexity of this code. And the papers usually say, well, these five measures that are very famous aren't any good. Here are my 72 measures that replace it. And then I'll get the next paper that says, well, these 70, we're up to 77, uh, these 77 measures aren't any good. Here are my 23 new measures that uh, or replace it. But no one ever goes back and justifies that any of their measures actually measure anything of value. They just look good. So you need to have relevance numbers. Not everyone applies the scientific method correctly. About 10 years ago, I think it was, Robert Park from the University of Maryland, who's spoken at NCAS so several times over these last 15 years or so, wrote a book called Voodoo Science. What he wanted to do was characterize different ways of misusing science. And he couldn't come up with a good way of clarifying them. I'll explain in a minute. So he just came up with four different categories and clumped the whole thing together as voodoo science. Uh, you can do bad science. You just, you, you're applying the scientific merit in, method incorrectly. And I have two examples of that in a minute. You can make mistakes. You forget a formula in a, in a spreadsheet. And you just sort of goofed in your calculations. I would say every scientist, sometime in their career, if they're honest, will admit to those two. You know, 
probably more than once, hopefully not too many times, but you know, everyone makes mistakes. You know, doing science is like any other activity. It's a human activity, people goof. But you hope not too often. And then we have fraud, intentional deception. Um, I hope no one here and none of the scientists I know, you know do that intentionally, but there are unfortunately too many examples of, of fraud. Uh, there are the cases in the last couple of years of the stem cell research in South Korea, I think it was, um, that really hurt stem cell research for the whole medical community because of basic fraud and um, what the results they got. Uh, and then the pseudoscience, where you violate some accepted principle of the world, like generating perpetual motion machines and so on. Uh, here's an example I came up with. I don't know how realistic it is, but uh, one example of bad science is confusing correlation with causation. Just because two events seem to occur together doesn't mean one causes the other. And the example I came up with is if you look at accidents of people who are driving Mercedes cars, I would claim this, I haven't checked this out, so I'm making a sort of a hypothesis, that um, the average income of the people who are in the accidents is much higher in Mercedes than people who aren't in Mercedes. So that means Mercedes drivers, rich Mercedes drivers are not good drivers. So we should only sell Mercedes to, to poor people because they have very few accidents. And, um, they're highly correlated uh, due to the price of the car, but one's probably not causal. Can't prove that, at least not here, but it's probably not causal. A better example that's more relevant to this community is the whole vaccine controversy. Uh, or to, you know, or, uh, the MMR vaccine causes autism. Well, vaccines are given around the age of you know, between one and two, and autism usually shows up sometime around two or so, or it's, it's first noticed. So you think, there, you, know, you, you could think that there's something in the vaccine and the anti-vaccine people have sort of focused on temerosol um, to show that, uh, well, they're, they're, cause, they're, cause, uh, they're, they're highly correlated, which is probably true, but they're probably caused. And there's been numerous studies um, to show that's not true. For example, the falsifi falsifiability claim. One way to falsify it is if you take the uh, so-called temerosol out of, you know, out of the vaccine, the, the autism rate should go down. And that's exactly what the uh, uh, CDC did in, I think it was like 2001 or somewhere around eight years ago. And you'd think that the autism rate would drop because now this uh, evil component was not in uh, vaccines. Well, the autism rate has stayed the same or increased. So um, correlation and causation is sort of an example of bad science. Uh, there are many methods of pseudoscience. There's an interesting website of someone who's been collecting them. And that's only half the list. You have another list. So <laughs> <laughs> there are lots of ways of showing. Uh, I know some, some, many of these. I probably can't define them all. But if you go to that website, there are many, many, you know, there are paragraphs describing each one. So there are many ways of showing something works. Does science tell us reality? Uh, scientific theory is characterized by making predictions that can be disproved or falsified by observation. Nothing is ever said about truth. Truth and falsity are philosophical concepts. Science doesn't deal with truth. They deal with making observations, generating a model of the world, and then making predictions of that model, which may or may not be true.